You know, David discovers Jonathan's son. Now, here's his name, Mephibosheth. That's an interesting time to look at the Bible as we look at this today in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Jen. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are going through the Bible, Genesis 1, Revelation 22 every year. Today, in three minutes, we're going to talk about this. Corey and Ryan are also here. All right. Well, today I'm taking another look at David on the pages of history as opposed to on the pages of the Bible. Brian? Well, today we read about an expensive kingly crown that was fitted with a precious stone. And the Bible makes a lot of mentions of precious stones. But what makes a precious stone a precious stone? That's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, excellent. Janice? Today... God's mercy. All right. So take your Bible guide and turn to the passage. If you don't have one, we'll tell you how to get one in just a moment. But let's open up the Word of God, the most important book of all. Let's hear God. Second Samuel 9, 1 through 13. Now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house, you, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. 2 Samuel chapter 9 Verses 1 through 13. What does it mean to do good? Well, a lot of people say, well, if you're doing good, you're doing things that people like, and people will like you. But let me tell you something. There's good you do, and sometimes people don't like you because you're doing good. You know, that's interesting. In 2 Samuel 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, we begin to read that. We're going to focus today on 2 Samuel 9. What does it look like? to do good and to do the right thing. Well, that depends on how you define good and right. In our culture, we too often think what is good and right is determined by our feelings and determined by what we desire or by what is practical and pragmatic. Now, when it came to the household of King Saul, 
David chose to do the right thing according to the word of God. David had made a promise to Saul's family, and he was determined to keep it, mainly because of Jonathan, Saul's son. After the death of Saul and his sons, David inquired whether anyone was still alive from Saul's family. He learned that Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, had escaped death when he was only five years old and was left lame in his feet. It would have been totally normal for any descendant of the old king to have feared and expected death when summoned by the new king. But when Mephibosheth was there, he bowed down before David after David summoned him, and David told him, don't be afraid, and that he wanted to fulfill a promise made to Jonathan. What a huge relief and surprise that must have been. This was very different. This was not like other kings. This was this totally uh, unique. And we're going to study that today as we look at it, because I find this part of scripture absolutely amazing to me. So if you need a Bible guide, you can call us or write to us and get a Bible guide, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and click on it. it. takes you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. And also, it uh, takes you to a place where you can download it exactly how we printed it. Now, I want to thank you for your gifts, and they keep us alive. So thank you so much for that. But let's pray about this. Father, help us to see what David has done here, because this is unusual for this time. And you've called us to do unusual things for our time, things that are right, things that aren't necessarily normal, but they're right. Help us to have the courage to do the right thing as we see David doing the good things here. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we said together, amen. Now, the scripture is interesting. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, now David said... Is there anyone, I mean anyone, who is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba. And so, when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul, whom I may show the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Makar, the son of Emil in Lodibar. Now, I want to say that David discovers that Jonathan's son Mephibosheth is still alive. As people of God, we who are as people who love God and follow the Lord, we must always pursue the truth. We must always pursue the truth. There's a lot of times we watch the news or we watch things on the internet, and there's a great problem we have in that we try to make the world fit our needs. That's shifted and changed in the last 50 years. Because it used to be that as we grew, we figured ourselves to modify slightly to fit the world. Now we change the world to fit our needs. And that becomes a big problem. I, I just need to say that when doing right, we need to study the word of God and let it be the change in us so that we can change to do the right thing. Let's get on to the scripture because it says here in verse 5, Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Makar, the son of Emil, from Lodibar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all of the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continuously. Now, 
This is interesting because David did good and right according to the Lord. When we follow God, our actions will often surprise the world. Absolutely. David, everybody knows that when you're kings in those days, you just killed all the descendants, wipe them out, kill them. You want to get rid of the former king. David didn't do that. He preserved the former king's son's grandson. That's because of his covenant with Jonathan. He made a covenant. David understood the covenant. He was beginning to read the scripture. He understood that today. Now, that's something that we need to learn because as we see David grow in his spirituality, well, we see different temptations come his way and we get, we get that and we need to pay attention to that. Well, let's read the last part of this because this is interesting. And the king called Ziba to him, or Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all of his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, listen to me carefully, but Mephibosheth, the master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all, my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mekah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. And he was lame in both his feet. Brings me to the last point. No matter where they are, God takes care of his people. <laughs> The Lord makes us stronger than anything the enemy can toss at us. The Lord makes us stronger than anything the enemy can toss at us. Now, let me explain this. There is nothing in this world that the enemy can do to you that God is not strong enough to heal you from. Very interesting. Think that over for a while. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. I want to take a look at the biblical figure of King David, but I want to take a look at the extra biblical history that confirms his existence. And the evidence is really twofold. We've got outright mentions of David in literature that was written by, by enemies of Israel a little bit later on, referring to his dynasty. And then we've got circumstantial evidence of uh, archaeology that points to a centralized government in the time period of Saul, David, and Solomon. So Take a look. That King David existed as a historical person was settled in the 1990s. The discovery of the partial remains of a monumental stella at Tel Dan, the first fragment in 1993 and the second in 1994, coincided with a re-examination of another stella called the Mesha inscription or Moabite stone. Both monuments were erected by enemies of Israel and Judah, and both mention the royals of Judah as belonging to the House of David. In a phrase like House of David, the house is not a literal building, but is metaphorical, referring to the dynasty of a founding father, the descendants of an establishing king. Famously, the Bible records that God promised to build David a house, again, meaning a lineage, not a physical palace. 
The Tel Dan Stella is named for the city it was discovered in. We know it today only in part from those fragments found in secondary use in the early 90s. Scholars deduce from its contents and age that it was written by Hazael of Damascus, an Aramean king of the city-state of Damascus that's featured heavily in the Bible and had great success warring against Israel and Judah. The inscription commemorated his victories over Israel and Judah and would have stood in the gate of Dan for decades until the city was recaptured by Israel's King Jehoash and likely at that point smashed into its fragments and reused as building materials. Its fragments today record whole, partial, and implied names of several biblical kings and lists the kings of Judah as of the house of David. The House of David is also referred to in the Mesha inscription that records the same event from a different perspective as 2 Kings chapter 3. This inscription was commissioned by Mesha, king of Moab, enemy of Israel and Judah, at that time ruled by Joram and Jehoshaphat. The inscription also mentions Omri, verifies that Chemosh was the Moabite national deity, and several other elements of Moabite culture mentioned in the scriptures. Interestingly, there's also a disputed mention of David's name recorded in a victory inscription of Pharaoh Shishak, who attacked Judah during the reign of David's grandson Rehoboam. This Egyptian inscription refers to a portion of Judah as the Heights of David. There are also several lines of physical evidence for David's kingdom to be found in archaeological data from the 10th century BC. In a newly released study, scholar Josef Garfinkel brings together excavation reports and archaeological surveys from four sites to argue that evidence for a centralized government in Judah during David's reign can be demonstrated. Garfinkel believes that the core of David's kingdom began with four cities before expanding ever outwards, a picture that melds well with the biblical account. Garfinkel's excavations also revealed evidence for the architectural style of Solomon's temple in the form of a small shrine, and for the Bible's record of King Rehoboam's building activities. So there we go. There's going to be a lot more to study as we move on through the time period of the kings, as we see Israel and Judah growing and facing difficult times and new enemies. Uh, different kings' names are going to appear in different enemy archives. So I'm excited to take a look at that uh, with you this year. It's very, the, the study of the kingship uh, and the history of Israel mm. is fascinating in this time. Now, it's going to get more interesting as we go on. Uh, because there's other kings that come into play. The nation split the whole thing and they fall. Nation falls 722, the other one at 586, 88 BC. It's going to be very interesting. Thank you, Corey. Right? All right. Well, my focus today is on 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 26 through 31. And in these verses, Israel defeats Rabbah and the crown of the king of Rabbah is put on David's head. And verse 30 records that the weight of this crown was a talent of gold and in it was a precious stone. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what particular precious stone was in the crown, but there are many other places in the Bible where specific precious and semi-precious stones are mentioned, like diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. And these stones are really, really beautiful, but it might cause us to wonder what makes a precious stone precious? Well, that's a good question. From the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, the Bible makes many mentions of beautiful and valuable rocks. For example, in Genesis 2.12, we read about onyx stones. And in Exodus 39, the high priest was decorated with several precious and semi-precious stones, including, but not limited to, diamond, ruby, sapphire, emerald, and amethyst. Some other notable mentions of precious and semi-precious stones are found in Job, Ezekiel, and the aforementioned book of Revelation. Clearly, the creator God of the Bible appreciates beauty, and these stunning stones come in an array of sizes, colors, and formations. And with modern technology, scientists have finally been able to go behind the scenes and thus into the mind of God a little bit and identify and unlock the physical properties and the chemical compositions of rocks. And Christian scientists Michael Ord and Robert Carter, in their book Biblical Geology 101, have done just that. As they explain, with only a few exceptions such as coal, rocks are composed of minerals, and any given rock type can have one or more likely various combination of minerals. 
Minerals are made up of atoms that are arranged in a repeating order. This order is incredibly important. For example, even though coal and diamonds are made up of nearly pure carbon, the precise arrangement of the carbon atoms in a diamond makes them hard, clear, and quite beautiful. Diamond is very different from coal, but the only real difference is the order of atoms within. Each mineral has its own chemical composition and its own distinctive physical properties. These are often used to identify the rock. A few rock types are composed of a single fairly pure mineral. We call these crystals. Some crystals are common, like quartz. It is made of one part silicon and two parts oxygen, so we call it silicon dioxide. And it is so common that ground up silicon dioxide is just called sand. Pure quartz is nearly transparent, but quartz crystals can also have beautiful colors if they contain specific impurities. Amethyst is a purple to reddish purple quartz that contains traces of iron or one of the other iron-like transition metals. Rose quartz is pinkish in color and contains traces of titanium, manganese, or iron. Other crystals are rare and beautiful, making them valuable. These include diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. These crystals are called gems. So to summarize, rocks are made of minerals, and minerals are made of one or more elements from the periodic table. We also know that all gems are minerals, but not all minerals are gems. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, these discoveries caused me to take a step back and to echo the words of Job when he said, but now ask the beasts and they will teach you and the birds of the air and they will tell you or speak to the earth and it will teach you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. So I hope that you enjoyed getting a bit of a behind the scenes look at God's handiwork. And if you want to go even deeper, then I really, really recommend the book by Michael Ord and Robert Carter called Biblical Geology 101. And you can get that book through Creation Ministries International. And you can check them out at creation.com. Also, if you want to watch a replay of this segment, then it is posted on my YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and search my name and you'll find me. The name is Ryan Hembry. Very good. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent piece too. Uh, Janice? Yes, today we're going to talk about God's mercy. I want to say right off the top, you know what? You're not forgotten. You might feel as though you have been forgotten, but God knows who you are. He knows where you are. He designed and made you for a purpose, and you are not forgotten. Today, we meet a, a, a man named Mephibosheth. He was the son of Jonathan. We know from the scriptures that the day that his grandfather would have been King Saul, his father was the son of Saul, and uh, Jonathan, and his father, and his brothers were killed, and that meant bad news for any relatives of the king and their family. When uh, Mephibosheth's nurse, uh, nurse maid, found out about the deaths, she picked him up. I think he was about five years old at the time. She picked him up and ran. As she was running, we find out from the scripture she fell. Somehow that injured that, that boy's legs and feet, and he ended up being lame. So we're looking here. David, many years before, had made a covenant, a vow with Jonathan that he would take care of his family were anything to happen. David has not forgotten about that. And that's where we pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David's asking, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And here we learn about Mephibosheth, who's now grown up. And it says, um, then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who's lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. So we hear about Mephibosheth and he comes, he comes before King David. And this could have gone very differently because the new king, David, could be coming after him to kill him. But David says to him, don't, don't fear. Don't fear me. I'm here because I, I want to take care of you. So we find out that 
Mephibosheth is not only going to be honored, he's not only going to be given back the land that was his grandfather's, King Saul's, but King David is going to have him eat at the king's table like he is a son of David for the rest of his life. This honor, and, and we can go into more detail about Mephibosheth's reaction to that. He, he's, he's shocked. But here's what I want to bring up and put it into a little bit of context of where we could be today in our lives. We may feel that something that has happened in our past has put us in a place that we don't fully understand why we're there. But I want you to know that God knows exactly why and where you are. So don't feel as though you're stuck in a place and you can't get out. I wonder, you know, Mephibosheth was lame in his, in his legs. He had to be taken care of. And yet God knew exactly where he was. God will meet you where you are. God can restore you and give you a purpose. Mephibosheth was to eat at the king's table for all his days. You know, God has made a way for you, for me, through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you come to him today, in all honesty, come to him. And if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead in the flesh for three days, and, and you, you invite him into your heart to forgive you of your sins, he will do that for you. And you can commit your life to follow him. Then you don't need to be stuck where you are. God can bring change to your life. Allow him to do that. We continue with prayers to India because India is such an important part of the world. It's the largest country in the world and there are 67 million Christians there according to the report from Open Doors Ministries. And we need to pray for them because persecution has risen dramatically. And I pray for India, Lord, that you would help the people there, preserve the pastors, keep them safe, help those who are persecuting them see that you are the Lord and help them to surrender their lives, that they can serve you in Jesus' name, amen. 